hello everybody. My name is System Freak. Uh, usually you see me streaming things like uh, video tests on Mob Crush or just sometimes I stream games. Um, I decided to do something a little bit different today. Um, I actually have this woodworking project I'm going to work on and uh, so I decided a lot of people on the internet don't really know how to woodwork. It's a dying art. Um, most people play games. <laughs> That's what they're doing on Mob Crush and Twitch and Facebook and all these things. So I decided to just kind of show you some basic tools I'm going to use for this. Uh, just a couple small little tricks that you might be able to use if you ever actually build anything yourself. Um, yeah, we're just going to see what it is. So let's get started talk. So what I'm going to be building is a pegboard, uh, well basically DIY pegboard. Uh, it's going to be made out of a 4 foot by 8 foot piece of plywood. Um, there's going to be three holes by three holes drilled in, so nine holes total. Uh, and we're going to fit in one inch dowel into the holes uh, to basically, well it's going to be one inch diameter and about six to seven inches long uh, depending on how well the friction holds. Um, and it's basically just like a pegboard you put hang something up and of course a plane flies right overhead while I start this. Okay, so anyways, um, so it's a little project do, we're going to paint it. It's really simple. So basically the first thing I do for any woodworking project is plan. Woodworking takes time. You don't rush it. You rush it, you get really bad things. Uh, if you want to build something quick, buy something from Ikea. If you're gonna build it by hand, take your time. Uh, that's where the old, out of you know, measure twice, cut once comes into play because you need to take your time to make sure everything's right to get the best results and also to make sure it works. So, uh, in that aspect, we actually had a plan. I got some specs to what it should be. So I measured out some of the pieces on here. I'll show you how I, you know, will use chalk to chalk the lines to uh, basically know where I'm gonna drill at because uh, let's be face it, a lot of people haven't made stuff. I had a blessed childhood. I grew up in a rural area. Uh, we had ducks and geese and chickens and uh, animals. It was just kind of fun. We built, my dad showed me how to build a lot. Uh, he owned a dump truck. He worked on it, showed me about cars and stuff. That's why I have my park garage here. It's half woodworking half auto. <laughs> um, not finished, still remodeling a little bit, but it's there. But let's get into this. So I have my part list. I went to the store, bought all my parts at once because I knew what I needed because it sucks to have to stop in the middle of your project and then go to the store to pick something up and break your momentum and root groove. Because woodwork is kind of like Zen. You build it, you, you start getting some, you just kind of start getting the zone and it's, it's calming. That's why I do it. That's, you know, I don't do it because, oh, I need to build this. I tend to build things because I enjoy woodworking. I, I like wood. I like, uh, you know, drilling, using my hands, creating something from nothing or, you know, nature wood and whatever other stuff I find. But, so I already have all my stuff. I've laid out some tools I'm using and I'm going to talk about it. So the first thing you have to do is measure out your marks on your board. I've already done that um, just because... I'm assuming you all know how to use a tape measure. For those of you from Mars, this is a tape measure. It has nice inches here. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, for those that haven't used a tape measure, because that is in existence, there's a little button here, a little switch. So when you pull it out, and you push that switch and lock it, it holds in place. Ooh. Like I said, most people already know that, but the benefit of doing this when you're measuring, so when you are by yourself like I am, and you use this little hook, on the edge to measure your distance, lock the tape measure in place, and then you can use your hand to mark it. Self-explanatory, but let's face it, a lot of people haven't worked with tools these days. It's not like they have a woodworking shop at a lot of high schools anymore. So tape measure, so I measured everything out, and speaking of it, do yourself a favor, do not use this, use this. This is basically, that's basically a construction pencil, usually flat, kind of, not really squarish, or kind of oval-ish, oh, not oval, let me see if I can get in there, yeah, kind of a, a rectangle. Um, reason is, is that, yeah, it's great that these little things, but you're working with wood, you need a nice dark mark. This graphite kind of works a little bit, you can, erasers are completely pointless on wood. Um, so, I just recommend picking these up, they're cheap, you can have a lot of them. Also, the benefit is to sharpen these, all you need to do is just get out your utility knife, nice little utility knife, and just go whoop. Yes, they sell sharpeners in the store, but why spend money for a sharpener when you probably have a utility knife or any other knife? 
So that way you can just sharpen the job, you have your pencil with you, and it won't break as much as that one will. It's a little more sturdy. Um, plus they're a lot easier to see and they don't roll. See the problem with these pencils is you put them on a table and they might roll off or something. These ones, that's why they're flat. You can just place them down and, well, you can't see that. <laughs> but you can place them down on the surface and they just won't roll. So do yourself a favor, just pick up some of these or like less than, I, I think I picked up a ton of these, it's Home Depot, just they have them in the, the hardware section, cheap as anything. Might as well just pick some up instead of having to use other stuff. The main reason is, my dad always told me the right tool for the right job. If you don't use the right tool, it's not gonna come out well. You're gonna basically, it's either gonna come out garbage or it's gonna come out to, uh, it'll just make your life difficult. And if the part of this is for enjoyment, you don't wanna be cursing when you're sitting here trying to build something. So, there we go, we got, uh, pencils out. I marked it down. So what do we do? I actually just marked when I basically if you think about it Let's say I have a piece of wood. I put it up. I made a little notch So once I put the notch up the question is I had this four foot by eight foot piece of plywood and made these little notches How in the heck am I gonna draw a line? Uh, as you were taught in school, you can use a ruler. Uh, yeah, you could uh, Some people do but the problem is eight foot rulers <laughs> Don't exist, but there's an easier way, like I said, right tool for the right job. So what I'm gonna be using is a chalk line. Chalk lines are really cool, and they're really useful, they're really quick. I'm gonna demonstrate how to use one later on. But basically all it is, is that it is a, an anchor like this, tied, strapped onto a piece of rope or a little twine, and it's spiraled in here. That's what it's so winch is to wind it back up. So all you do is a little door here, and what you get when you usually get one of these, you get some chalk. You know, um, I don't know if they have this exact model, I had this a while ago, but basically all you have to do is you open up your chalk, there's a little window usually, you open up your little window, you squeeze in your chalk in there, and you close your window. These lines are self-chalking, which means when you pull it out, chalk will get applied to the line. Uh, you just have to make sure there's actually enough chalk in there to do it. Um, actually, I think I probably used all the ones. Last project I did, I built a huge uh, cabinet for my wife. so. I'm just gonna put a little more in there. You don't gotta use tons of this stuff. Chalk is, it's liberally used, but you don't want excess on your project. So basically what happens is when you have your chalk line, you put this on the end on your little edge of your plywood, just like you're gonna measure, but you already have your measure marks. So you put, that's what this is for. See this little hole here? You will put your measure mark right where that hole is on that line, cause that's gonna line up your line. So you do that. Most of these have a lock where that's like this, where it won't spin because that's in place. So just open it up. Put that in place and then slide it across. See some chalk probably falling out. That's what happens when you chalk it fresh. This is blue chalk. This line is actually, if you look at it, this line is actually yellow and black and a little white. But the blue is the chalk. So when you put this across and I'll wind it up like that, when you put this across a piece of board, and you pull it tightly, you now know between the point that you marked on one side, the point on the other side, a straight line. We all know geometry, or we should. That makes a straight line. Well, cool, you have this chalk. Now, the way to get the chalk from the line to the board is that you pull it really tightly, hold it in place, make sure it lines up, and you pluck it. You pull it back and release it real quick, and it'll snap against the board. Then you take your chalk line off, wind it up. You can blow off the chalk, or I have an air compressor, I just kind of blow off the excess and you have a nice, beautiful, straight line that's visible and easy to see. And after you use it, you can clean it up um, because we all sand before we paint, right? We're supposed to, we should, and yes, I'm going to, so I'm not too worried about the little chalk line that's on there because it'll be, most of it'll be taken up when I clean it up and then sand it, and then, you know, at that point, it should be almost invisible if completely gone, and if not, the paint will cover it up. In this case, uh, I'm using paint I know for a lot of woodworkers out there, it's a mortal sin. It is for me. This is not my project. I don't have a choice on it. I prefer stains and varnishes. I'm a very, if you notice my countertop here, natural wood kind of a guy. If I need heavy duty, I'll, okay, metal's fine, but um, I prefer not to paint wood. But in this case, it's requested. I'll paint it, no big deal, it happens. There's a reason it needs to be painted. It makes sense. Uh, I just, I like the natural look of wood. The grain is beautiful when it's stained and varnished properly and, and it lasts forever if you knew it right. So anyways, so that's how we get our line down. So now we have our line, we have all our thing marked out, cool. The next step is on this project is I need to drill holes to fit the pegs. 
Well, there are several ways to drill holes. Most of you have probably seen a drill, if not used one, and you know this. This is a standard drill bit. This is, a, this is actually a universal drill bit. It's made for several things, several different types. The main reason is its shape. Uh, woodworking drill bits usually have a little point on front to help guide it because wood is soft and porous and it kind of sticks in to help kind of push it in. This can be used on multiple materials. When you go to the store and look at your drill bits, it'll tell you what it's used for. If you don't know which one to buy online, you can look up drill bit guide and it'll blow your mind how many drill bits are in the world. But this is just kind of standard universal drill bit. Problem with these is I need to build a drill in one inch diameter hole. That's not one inch. They do make drill bits that are that wide and they are extremely long. Those are actually not considered drill bits. Technically, they're kind of called augers. What an auger is really kind of used for is to drill into uh, large foundational beams or things like that, where you have to make a large hole very deep because that's why they're so long. Um, we don't need that for our project. We are working with three quarter inch plywood, so we don't need something, augers and overkill. So you are left with two choices for this. And it depends on which side of the fence you're on, but then you have your spade or some people call them shovels which it looks like these. Now this one I have, and I tend not to like these kind of spades too much because that you see it looks kind of screw on the front. It's kind of like a self-tapping front guided thing. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But basically a spade is a flat drill bit that has uh, an edge on both sides. So it kind of cuts as it goes through. Now you'll see these little points on the top. Some spades don't have those. If you're working with wood, you want these points on the side. This will give you a cleaner cut. The flat ones don't cut as well as the little pointy ones do. Uh, different brands sell them, they look a little bit different, but basically if the edges are kind of a little bit pointed and this flat part is a little curved or not as even with the rest, that's what you want. You don't want a straight flat uh, spade because it just, it causes problems. It doesn't cut well, it kind of chatters a little bit. Um, when we're talking about woodworking, we say chatter. It usually means when you're drilling, the kind of bit kind of does this and kind of moves around a little bit. We call it chattering sometimes. So this is a one inch thing. I could use this and it would work. The thing is that typically with spades or shovels, um, you don't get a very clean hole. Uh, it's good for most purposes, but if you want something that's actually a really clean, nice, smooth, solid hole, um, I wouldn't use a spade. I would use this bit and I can never pronounce these things properly. Uh, a Fresner, something like that. You can look them online. I think it's a Fresner or Frosner bit. Um, as you can tell, it looks a little more high tech. It's kind of cool. Um, the difference about these bits is that unlike that one, it doesn't guide from the front. It actually does on the sides. So the way that this bit cuts, it's more like a normal drill bit where the side, these parts on the side actually are what cut it and push it into the board a little bit, along with your own you know, strength a little. The benefit to these bits, the way they're designed, they bore a very smooth hole, which is exactly what I want. Um, I want a lot of, a nice tight bit against those, um, those dowels when you're using. So if I use a spade, the rough edges of chatter that when it's digging in might be enough that it won't have enough grip, and I'll talk about the friction thing, but I have enough grip to hold the dowel in place when I slide in. So I'm not gonna glue them, we're not gonna do anything. They're made to come in and out for transportation. Um, when I talk about a friction grip, uh, it's as simple as, well, I can show you. Give me a moment, I'll grab this. Okay, here we go. This is a dowel, it's uncut, I'm gonna cut it later. But um, whenever I do these kind of things, I always do, I, you always have, when you do woodworking, you always have scrap wood. Um, I usually just kind of test out some things, some thoughts about how to do stuff. This was, uh, I tried to make a jig, I'll test one of that in a minute, uh, to make a, a, a clean perpendicular hole that's the right angle. Um, they didn't come out very well, so I just decided to go out and get this really cheap dig to do it. But basically a friction grip is, you just notice it's just a hole, this is just a dowel, and it goes on. It, if you can't really see, and obviously you can't feel it, but it actually will hold the dowel in place pretty well. Um, because it's a friction, it's holding tightly because the, the hole is just big enough to fit the dowel through. It's not so hard that you have to actually hammer the dowel in, but you do have to put a little force to kind of get it in, which is what we want. You want a nice friction grip when you kind of do these projects because 
you don't want your dowel just sliding out or anything like that. So, by the way, this is, notice it's round and long. It's kind of like a cylinder. These are not poles, they're called dowels. No matter how long they are, they're dowels. This is a long wooden dowel. Um, this one I'm gonna be cutting up is actually 12 feet long. Um, like I said, I'm gonna make seven to eight, um, well, probably six or seven inch increments. I haven't really figured out exactly how long I want it, but both will work. I just have to kind of think of how I wanna do that. But yes, those are dowels. It's, it's kind of important to know what terms you are, because when you go into uh, like a, a hardware store or like a tool store, if you go in there and start just going, I need the thing that connects to the, you know, this thing that spins, they're gonna look at you funny. Uh, <laughs> do some reading online. People, you know what, a lot of you go out there and read online about, you know, video games or cooking or this and that. Woodworking's the same thing. There's tons of information online. And if you don't, you might have a friend who knows it, but you can ask for the right term, and when you talk to the, the, you know, the person that helps you, it helps them better understand what you want. Because if you go and, like for example, if you go and say, I just want a spade, they might not give you this. They might send you gardening, because there's a gardening tool called a spade. You could say, I need a drill bit, that I need a spade or a shovel bit for my drill or something like that. It gives them more of an idea of what you want. Um, just kind of like that. But, Going back to drill bits, as I talk about the friction joints, there is another difference to both of these. This bit takes a lot more torque to work. Uh, it actually needs a, a drill with good torque. Uh, so I tend not to use uh, battery drills, even though you can. Uh, they just kind of wear out faster. Well, not they don't wear out. The battery dies. And when you're in the middle of a working project, nothing that sucks worse than when wearing out. <laughs> so that's that so my preference is a corded drill there's corded and cordless cordless have to deal with batteries corded have a cord to them uh there are several different types of drills impact drills hammer drills uh torque they're just yeah there's a lot of them the you can go and talk to the, the, the person they'll tell you what you need based on your project but this is kind of just a nice heavy duty drill has a torque i need to get it through Oh yeah, hi out there, John. I noticed uh, we have some chat there. John's coming and seeing oh, uh, Super Sandoval School Session. Yeah, uh, I should change my name to Wood Freak and not Sister Freak for this show. But uh, these drills are amazing. They're cool. Cords, I know people hate cords. They're not fancy nowadays, but they are very useful in the woodworking world. Just be careful not to cut them. I have a story of my father. He's cutting a piece of plywood on his, on his table saw. The wood, don't ask how, got kind of tangled up into the cord. The cord went through the saw and the saw cut out. <laughs> and, you know, there's stories like that. All of a sudden, spark and everybody's like, what? And, yeah, it's a whole thing. And they, it's a pain to replace, but it's just kind of fun to do it that way. Uh, do I have a chainsaw? Actually, I don't do a lot of yard work. My wife hates plants. She kills them purposefully. Not just like she doesn't have a green thumb. She kills plants. She goes out of her way to annihilate every green plant I had. My lawn has been repaved with, uh, with nice stone pavers. It looks good, but my grass is gone. My backyard had a couple of trees when we first moved in, some nice grass around it. Uh, that's completely paved over and cemented. Uh, there are four large pepper trees I have in my backyard. Uh, my wife's already planning to kill those. Um, so it's a constant battle of nature versus urban in my house. So because of that, I don't have a lot of yard working tools. I have a lot of just normal woodworking tools. Uh, yes, chainsaw can be considered woodworking, but uh, I do more craft woodworking. I guess you can consider it carpentry would probably be a better word. Now, I'm no carpenter. I'm an amateur. I kind of just learned this from my father, what I've seen online, what I read. But that's how it goes. Okay, so I kind of bored you to death on drill bits. Um, let's see. So once we have the holes drilled in the wood, we have to put in hinges. Now, uh, I don't have the hinges with me, but everybody knows what a door hinge looks like. It's kind of a panel and it goes like this, right? And there's a little, uh, that's a barrel hinge. We're not gonna get into that. Basically, it's the kind of hinge that we use for doors when we use for this project. Now, you could just screw it onto top of the plywood. Yes, you can. Um, I won't say there's nothing wrong with it, but it'll work. Um, a better thing to do I already told you what a drill bit is, John. See, that's why you you need to get alerted. So we know everybody follow my channel. So when I go online about these little informations, you can get right away, you can review this video, but this is a normal drill bit. It goes into our drill. 
and it's also in a new video. So this is a great time to remind you guys to like, subscribe, whatever you have on there um, on the platform you're at. Because the great thing about Crush, I'm streaming to everywhere. So uh, there's lots of terms for the different likes and stuff. So uh, we should just come up with a universal uh, click the button thingy that says that I'm cool and then click the button that tell you that I'm streaming and then there you go. So we have our bits, we have our drills, we have our holes drilled and I was talking about now how to put in this uh, hinge. You could screw it on top and just leave it there, but I'd rather sink the hinge in. Um, it's a lot clearer look. You notice that's how it is on your doors. If you've never actually looked at your, uh, the doors in your house when they open, actually go home and do this or in your office or wherever you're at because they're all done this way. Open up the door and actually look at the hinge between the door. <laughs> oh, I'm cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, sometimes I, 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 I like to think I am at least and my mom says I am. Uh, <laughs> My wife, not so much. So when you open up the door, look at it, and you actually see that the hinge, the hardware that holds a door to get onto the door frame, is actually inside the wood a little bit. We, we sink it. The reason we do that is it's a cleaner look, um, and the, when you close the door, it'll actually butt against without any holes, any space between it, which is important when you're folding objects onto each other. You might be asking, how do you do that? Well, we do that with this awesome, cool piece of tool that I have here, and I'm running out of space. This is a router. Now this is a small hand router. Um, there are table routers or several ways to do it, but I prefer hand routers. I have a lot of hand holes because I tend not to work with, uh, I work with smaller pieces of things. So these kind of little smaller tools work for me. What a router is, it's pretty much, you can imagine it like a heavy drill that you use like this. The piece of wood's on the bottom, this sits on it and it goes around. Now you can use a router for two purposes mainly. You can edge a piece of wood so when you go and see like your cabinet doors in your house and it has that cool little beveling on the edge. The next Bob Vila. Yes, it's maybe one day. So when you have the cool little beveling on the edge of your cabinets, that's done with a router um, or an industrial tool that mimics what a router is. But you can do it at home with a router. And the way you do it is with router bits. So you can do the edges or you can make the little notches in the wood like you see in the door frame with those hinges. So I'm going to do that with this when I do my project. Now there are several router bits. These are just a few. For example, uh, to do a decorative edging, I'd probably use this one. This is one, if you notice, see the curve. Now if you imagine if your wood is sideways like this and this bit goes over it, uh, kind of like that, it's gonna cut that curve into this edge of the wood. So that's how we get it with these bits and they have a little, usually a guide, there's a little like a ball, or, um, a ball bearing there just to help it screw them across so you don't cut too much off. The difficulty with using a lot of these tools, routers especially, it takes some practice, is keeping your line straight. Now, everybody just thinks, I get a drill and I drill a hole and it's great, right? The problem is if you actually know, if you actually measure this hole, it's off. It's not perfectly 90 degrees. It's probably, you know, off by a good five degrees or so. That's because we're using hand tools, there's no guide. Yes, it's level, but you can go this way sometimes or you can kind of wobble it or something. That's something we have to kind of deal with. And that's what I'm going to also have to worry about with this project. So drilling these, uh, routing out these little notches, not a problem. If I was going to use the actual edge of the whole thing, I'd actually I'd probably have to make some guides. Um, and we can go over that later and how that's done. But to keep my drill straight, I'm going to use this handy dandy little tool. Uh, this is a cheap portable drill rig. Um, it's also referred to as a drill guide. So on a drill we have several parts. This on, is also on a normal drill, this part right here, and I will to show you it is also right here. That's referred to as the chuck, or it's where you chuck. It's what holds a bit in. So the bit will go, I can't turn this right now, but basically the bit goes in on the bottom right here. You turn this to tighten it. Now, the way you use these drill rigs is that you can set an angle to them. So we set them flat against something, it'll be a better angle this way. You can actually drill down at the right angle consistently. This one's set to 90 degrees, that's what I do on this board, but you can set it to other angles. There's some better ones on the market, but that's that. So once you put the bit on this side, guess what goes up here? Your drill. You tighten your drill onto the top of this, and boom. You put this on your wood, and then when it goes down, it will cut into the wood, pull it up, and you will get the same cut every single time if it's a good jig. Now I keep on using that word jig. Let me just tell you what that is. A jig is just, it's not a tool on its own. We're basically, uh, sorry, I'm dropped something. 
What a jig is, it's a guide or it's something to help your tool do what it's supposed to do. In this case, this helps my drill go in and out. Other than that, up and, sorry, up and down at an angle. Other than that, this will not really do anything on its own. I have a tool. There are other jigs that help cut things, you know, drill at angles, cut right, cut things at right angles. Like I was saying, those guide fences I was gonna do, that can be considered a jig if I actually kind of build it with a little clamp set I can reuse. The whole point of jigs is that they're reusable. If you come across a problem once, you're gonna come across it in the future. So woodworkers tend to have a lot of scrap wood and jigs lying around. Um, the ones that were really hard to make, they keep. The ones that are uh, simple to make, they kind of just chuck them and they'll make new ones if they need them, just to save space. Okay, so we have now holes in our thing, perfectly perpendicular. We have the part routed out for the, the hardware. That's perfectly there. We have that done. You can just screw in hardware. I'm sure everybody knows how to use a screwdriver. If not, you can use a drill and a screwdriver bit. We'll go over you know, some other things later, but all that's done. What's next? I'll give you a choice out there. It's after you work with your project, you have to finish it, right? So what's the first thing you do when you finish wood? Painting or anything like that. If you set open your paint, you get an F. <laughs> sand, 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 sand. Don't rush. You just spent all this time measuring, drilling, making sure your holes are perfectly perpendicular. Everything is, it works exactly, it looks like you want it. Now you want to finish it so it lasts forever. Because wood, honestly, there's reasons there's, you know, chairs from the 1800s that are people buying their inventions still work. Because wood can last forever if it's built solid. But why ruin your project by skipping a vital step? As hard and boring as it is, sanding is very vital. This is called an orbital sander because it spins. It basically is kind of oscillates and orbits a little bit. It doesn't actually constantly spin like that. There's a, a tool, and if you ever see one in action, you'll see it. But basically, you plug it in, put your sandpaper on here, push this button on top, and it kind of vibrates and stuff, and you just kind of move it around. So yes, we need a sand. I use a sander. You can do it by hand. Uh, for those that have dedication to sand four pieces of four foot by eight foot plywood by hand, I salute you. I don't. <laughs> I will use tools when I have the chance. That's one of them I'm using. Now, here's a tip on sanding. When you're sanding wood, they usually notice they might sell these kind of, this is for these orbital sander packs. They might sell little packs like this that have different gauges of sandpaper in them. And I'll show you what one of these little discs look like. So this red part right here is actually the sand, this coarse part, and the back is Velcro so it sticks on the back of that. Now they usually have some in packs. Other places you buy variety packs because it's cheaper and I wanna try everything out, right? I might find use for it. The reason they do it for sandpaper is that actually each one of these grits of sandpaper is something you use right away. For example, uh, if you're used, there's two types of plywood. There is cabinet grade plywood and there's kind of just normal grade plywood. Normal grade plywood is kind of coarse. It's kind of plywood you might think about when you when you think about plywood. It might have some holes and knots and kind of be really rough and doesn't look that good. And then most people don't think about cabinet grade plywood when they buy plywood, but if you go into a kitchen and if it's not fake, it's actually made out of plywood. Your cabinets are made out of plywood. They're made out of a special plywood that's high quality. Cabinet grade plywood is high quality, looks beautiful, has a nice, nice finish veneer on it when you're done. It's a little more expensive. It's also a little heavier. There's some other things about it. But if you're using the normal plywood, not cabinet grade, just the standard plywood you buy that's cheap, you would use this 80 grit sandpaper. That's the first round you go over it. It will smooth it out. Now, why don't you just jump to the finest sandpaper and use that? It will be very hard to take the scratches out. The whole point of the coarse sandpaper is to take off a decent layer of your, material, of your wood to get rid of all the nicks and dents and, and make it kind of a nice smooth perfection. So your 80 grit will get your normal plywood, your standard plywood, to cabinet grade kind of smoothness. It's, the wood's not the same, but at least the smoothness will be. From there, you move up to 150-ish, around that ballpark. Um, that's a fine grind, that's a fine, gra uh, fine grain sandpaper. It'll smooth it out and get it prepped. I take it to the last step, usually doing a 220 grit or something around two, uh, above 200. To get a nice, smooth, you know, beautiful, smooth finish on that wood. Now, you're not going to put away your sander. 
when you're finished with that, and the reason is is because you're gonna sand it after you paint it. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but believe me, it is useful. So you're gonna sand, you're gonna paint. Nice, even, smooth coats, very minimal paint. Don't glop it on. You know, whenever you see these bare like primer and stuff in one, one coat, yeah, sure, your walls, they don't necessarily look the best. It can work, whatever. For wood, if you're gonna use paint, please don't use one coat of paint. Make it look nice. So sand it from those three levels to get it to a nice one. If you already start off with cabinet grade, you can skip the 80 grit and go to the 100, you know, 150 ish grit. Smooth it out, nice and smooth. Get it nice and finished, blow away the dust, wipe it with a rag, make sure it's nice and clean and dry, not damp, and it's perfect, it's ready to accept the paint. And then you're gonna paint your paint on, after you sand it. For me, um, I can do paint brushes, but I prefer a paint sprayer. This is a small little hobby sprayer. Um, I use this for, I've used this for automotive paint. I've also used it for house paint. It's a project paint sprayer. You can use anything you want with it. Um, basically, it's simply just put the paint in here, lock it in and put a mnemonic hose to here and spray. What's mnemonic? Uh, I have an air compressor. So I use air compressed tools for several things. Uh, they're great for blowing dust and sand dust off of you. but also great to run tools like this. So basically I don't, I have my own air compressor. I don't have to go to the store and buy one to borrow one. I can use it to inflate my tires, all the happy fun stuff. Um, it is a 30, I believe it's a 33 gallon air compressor. I'll show you, see if I can see on the corner. It's just right there, that, that red thing right there. This is the actual container to hold the air compressed. And this up here is a motor to compress the air and push it in. There's a nozzle and hose that will connect to that handy dandy little tool or any other tool I want to use with it. And there we go. So I have my paint in there. Now, just a tip about that. Household paint, regardless if it's latex or if it's oil-based, will not spray from these directly. They're too thick, um, especially if you get Primer and base one makes it even thicker. So if you're using a latex paint, which is water-based, you can add some, uh, some. there's a chemical you can add to it that will improve the flow. It's called paint conditioner flow improver, something like that. You can add that, which will help. And you thin it out with a little water, just a little bit, not much. Um, just enough that it, this will be able to suck it in and it's not like trying to suck a, an ice cream malt through a straw and the straw collapses. I'm sure we all have done that. Don't do that to your tools. So if it's latex, you can do it that way. If it's oil, you have to use paint thinner. Um, not too much, just enough to thin it out. Also use some flow improve and it'll actually go through your gun a lot better. Uh, you, I don't know many people still use oil-based paints for most things. I know a lot of people tend to use just latex. It dries quicker, oil takes forever to dry. Um, it's easier to deal with because you, you don't have to use turpentine or stuff like that. It's easy to clean out this because just soap and water and it's pretty much done. Um, after you do that, please oil it with, you know, if you're using a, a mnemonic tools, I'm sure you know this, but use a proper oil. Get all the parts lubed up again. You don't want anything to rust or seize or, or just be stubborn and stiff. Uh, a good bolting and clear tool is an invaluable thing. So cool, you did that. You sprayed one coat of spray on it. Just one thing, just enough to cover. Okay, it's on. The next step would be to sand again. Yes, high grit sandpaper, 220 plus. Um, you're not trying to take the paint off. You're just doing kind of a once over just to kind of uh, get some, just smooth it out a little bit. It will take some of the paint off, that's okay. But before you sand, please wait for it to dry. I didn't say that and I know it probably goes without saying, but maybe someone's going there, oh, I'll just do what he says and just sand it right away. No, let it dry, let it cure for the time it says on the can. Then go over with sandpaper. Once that's done, another coat of paint. You could stop at two. I usually do. Two is good enough. Three is better, but two is good enough. But if you want to go another coat, another round of sanding, another round of paint, and believe me, you will not understand how smooth and how polished this cabinet will look. It will look amazing. Or if you have the time and you want to do paint and want to do it right, don't get a two-in-one, get a primer. Prime it, sand it, prime it, sand it. Then normal coat of paint, sand it, then your normal coat of paint and sand it. Uh, and then if you want, you can seal it with a sealer. That will give you the best finish you can ever see. That would be like the quality of stuff you could buy at high-end furniture stores when they paint and sell stuff. So there's that one. Okay, 
enough rambling. Uh, I think I told you about all the tools I'm going to use. I'm not going to demonstrate them all. One, because I actually have to get this project done. Uh, but also, uh, I don't want anybody watching me while I'm kind of messing up sometimes. <laughs> it's like, you know, don't look at the guy behind the curtain there. What I will do, though, is show you, uh, like I promised earlier, how to use a chalk line properly uh, for measurement. So let me just kind of set it up here real quick. It's not going to be that difficult. Okay. Loud noises. Yeah, you think that's loud? Wait till you hear a drill go off. Okay. So what you're looking at right now is probably where this is going to intersect. So I'm going to go to the far side of the board. And you'll see I'm pulling this out. Okay. Now I'm just going to lock this in place just because I'm going to let it hang for a second. But I have a marking right here, which is my measurement. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put it on that. Now, remember I told you, measure twice, cut once. Same thing with this. Make sure it's in the right place where you snap that line because you don't want to try to remove the old chalk line and try to make a new one. So I'm going to go over there and make sure it's still lined up on that side because I don't have a helper today. My son usually helps. I usually have the greatest help in the world, my eight-year-old son, but um, he's finishing his last few days of school today, so it's just me. Okay, so I have that one on the line I drew there measured. I moved it, measured it here. This is eight inches from this side. So pull it nice and tight and pluck it. It would actually help if... The problem is, is that this board is curved because there's nothing supporting the center, so I'll show you what it looks like. If I could, of course, it's going to be a fail. It did enough. Okay, that's enough for me to see. And then you just crank it and reel it in. Woo! There we go. Okay. It did enough where I needed to. It's not perfect. I should get another salt horse under here. But, there it is. Remember I told you I had an air compressor? Air compressor. See the dust? It's all gone. Like that's going to do anything for you guys. So let me bring you over here and show you what this looks like. Let's switch your camera around. Okay. Look. Two beautiful blue lines. I'm going to draw right that intersection. And I just need to chalk it a few more times on the... That I will have to drill. So I'll give me my four. That'll give me my nine drill holes. Just chalk in like that with the tools I showed you. I'll use the router and do recesses on this edge. And like I said, pretty much cover. You know, mask whatever I don't want to get covered with paint. Paint it up, and then put the hardware on. This is pretty much done. Now that might sound like a lot, but honestly, with the right tools, this is probably going to go pretty quick. I'm actually pretty excited. It's going to be kind of fun. And. Uh, yeah, so like I said, if you do everything right, these projects can be quick, can be done easily, can be done cheap. This is actually, compared to buying something like this, this is actually very cheap. Um, and there's always a cost of having to buy new tools because we always have to buy new tools. <laughs> That's my excuse to tell my wife, oh, I need a new tools for this project. Um, honestly, though, you probably can get away with about half price on anything that you own that you buy from the store with wood if you make it yourself, if you have the tools and the knowledge you know, uh, and not mess up. If you mess up, well, you have to buy more wood. But it takes time, it takes practice. It's a hobby. It's not meant to be thrifty or lucrative. You know, it could be lucrative if you get good at it. I'm not good at it. But it's good enough. Um, and we'll see how this comes up. I'm probably going to do another one when I get to, uh, I don't know, some part later stage in this. I don't want y'all to sit here and just hear loud whirling and drills going off and me cursing because I nicked something or did something wrong. But uh, until then, Nice you all, Mob Crush. Thank you all for uh, watching. I know uh, it's not as been exciting as a lot of our other streams that we have on Mob Crush or Facebook and out there in the world, but I'm sure uh, you might probably learn something. So 